My name is Tracy King. I'm the Myeloma Nurse Consultant at Royal Prince Alfred in Sydney. My role involves talking with and helping patients, their family and their friends learn about myeloma, its treatment and importantly and the focus of this talk is about how to identify and manage the symptoms relating to myeloma. We know that myeloma can cause a range of different symptoms. These symptoms can be caused directly as a consequence of myeloma, the disease, but perhaps more commonly as a consequence of the treatment we use to manage myeloma. We know the variety of symptoms can occur and these from our perspective as doctors and nurses looking after people with myeloma can be quite predictable and very manageable. It's important to say that they do vary very much between individuals. They vary in what symptoms people may acquire but also in how intense and how long those symptoms may last. So do resist the temptation to make comparisons as you meet other people with myeloma and talk amongst yourselves about what treatment you're having and what symptoms you may have. This is a very individual disease and the symptoms and side effects may be individual and that is okay. We know also that the symptoms and side effects not only can affect you physically in terms of symptoms but also on a social and psychological level too. They can impact how you live your life and particularly if you're still in the workforce whether you are able to continue going to work on the days that you have some treatment or not. So it's not just the physical symptoms we will talk about. What I'm going to concentrate on is some of the more common symptoms that I deal with on a daily basis with my patients. Those are the symptoms of peripheral neuropathy, which talks about nerve damage, the symptoms related to having side effects of steroid treatment, and symptoms relating to lowered blood counts, most importantly, the increased risk of infections. So let's talk about the first symptom. How do we manage peripheral neuropathy in patients with myeloma? It can be useful to understand what is neuropathy. So we'll talk about that first. Some of you may not have experienced this symptom and may not understand what it means. Peripheral neuropathy describes a condition where there has been damage to the peripheral nerves, leading to the changes in the way that these nerves work. Peripheral nerves encompass most of the nerves in the body outside of the brain and the spinal cord. The type of symptoms you may experience depends on which types of nerves are affected. We all have sensory, motor or autonomic nerves. Sensory nerves, as they sound, help us feel and uh, appreciate touch, hot, cold, how something may feel. Motor nerves help us um, move, help the muscles and parts of our bodies move. And autonomic nerves control aspects in our body that we are not consciously aware we are controlling, such as the blood pressure and your breathing and gut motility, etc. In myeloma, the causes of peripheral neuropathy can be multifactorial. For example, the myeloma protein, which can cause a thick thickening of the blood and can in some patients be manifest itself as amyloid, can in themselves affect the nerves and cause damage. Other conditions that people may well have, such as diabetes or if you've had a condition called shingles or nerve compression from injury or sport, etc., can also damage nerves. As we age, we have increased damage to nerves and some things such as lifestyle factors, such as consuming a large amount of alcohol, can also be damaging to the nerves. But in those people with myeloma, it is principally the drugs, the lidamide and bortezomib, which I'll refer to from now on as its more common trade name, Velcade. These two drugs are used very commonly to manage myeloma and are probably the two things that cause most peripheral neuropathy in people with myeloma. So how common is peripheral neuropathy, you may ask? Well, from diagnosis, you may already have a little bit of neuropathy because the protein can affect the nerves, 1 to 13 percent um, as an estimate. But overall, the vast majority of people, up to 75 or 80 percent of people, will experience neuropathy due to the thalidomide and Velcade that they have. 
So what are the symptoms of neuropathy? What may you expect? What signs may you have that um, begin to tell you that you may have this symptom? We know that the symptoms pretty much always start very mildly, but they do become more noticeable and potentially more severe over time. People often describe to me when we talk that the symptoms are more troublesome at night, and that is likely explained by the fact that at night time the world quietens down and your mind has time to think and appreciate the slight sensory sensations that may be altered in your feet or hands. Most commonly, peripheral neuropathy causes a sensory neuropathy that is most easily described as some numbness or coldness or pins and needles that you may feel or tingling in the tips of your fingers or the tips of your toes. You may find that you have some cramps in your legs or some extra sensitivity to touch. So secondly, you can have a more general lack of coordination, and this may be related to having some motor neuropathy. People often describe that they um, have difficulty buttoning a shirt or opening a jar, and we might ask you questions to help interpret this. Often people may have a slight difference in their gait also. Less common is an autonomic neuropathy, and this would manifest itself as some buzzing or ringing in your ears, or we may appreciate you have a lower blood pressure. Commonly, if you change from sitting to standing, where you may have what we call is a postural drop. If you stand up quickly and your blood pressure drops, you may feel dizzy. I mentioned before that Valcade and thalidomide are the two drugs that most commonly cause neuropathy in myeloma. So it's worth just mentioning how neuropathy may differ between these different drugs. Thalidomide has been around a lot longer for the treatment of myeloma, but we have had Valcade that we've used for several years now, and we have a greater understanding of the difference between the symptoms of neuropathy caused by these two drugs. Overall, both drugs can cause neuropathy, um, but the main difference between thalidomide is it tends to be a sensory neuropathy, and sometimes in Valcade-induced neuropathy, it can be a little bit more painful. Those tingling and pins and needles in your fingers and toes may be a little bit more painful if you're having Valcade. We know that neuropathy caused by thalidomide is linked to the dose and the length of time that you've had thalidomide. By that I mean the higher the dose and the longer you've had thalidomide, the more likely you are to have neuropathy and for it to be progressive and worsen. We know that the neuropathy caused by thalidomide can also be irreversible and your doctors and nurses will be looking out to minimize that risk. With Velcade, the neuropathy tends to come on within the first two or three cycles and the extent of the neuropathy plateaus at around cycle five of treatment. We manage that with dose adjustments with Velcade and we know that when we stop the Velcade treatment, the neuropathy can reverse in over 50% of patients. So an important part of managing any symptom is being able to understand exactly how that symptom affects you. So your doctors and nurses will be assessing at each visit any of the symptoms you may have. So how do we as doctors and nurses assess the degree of peripheral neuropathy you may have? One of the best and most effective things that we may ask is to, at each appointment, to ask you, do you have any numbness, tingling, or discomfort in your hands and feet? And this quite quickly can help us determine the degree of neuropathy you may have. We also have grading systems that help guide our management too, and these are very well established. There are also patient questionnaires, and some of you may have been given these questionnaires when you go to your clinic to see your doctor or nurse. Again, they ask simple questions of you. Do you have any changes in sensation in your fingers or toes? A good example of one of those questions is available for you to review and for us to look at on the Cancer Institute website, and I've included it on the slide in this talk. We can also do more comprehensive nerve conduction tests, and these may be useful in some patients. 
These would involve testing for autonomic or severe neuropathy and if that is indicated in your case, your doctor and perhaps a neurologist will talk to you more about this. So we know that peripheral neuropathy is quite common in people affected by myeloma. But more importantly, how do we manage neuropathy? Well, unfortunately, we don't have a magic bullet that's going to target the nerves and help them improve and heal. So the focus of our care is on dose adjusting the drugs that cause neuropathy, the thalidomide and the Velcade, and your doctors and nurses have very clear guidelines for how best to do this. Don't forget that a dose, a dose adjustment in your treatment does not necessarily mean that treatment will not work. Sometimes less can be more and a slight reduction in dose which allows us to push on with treatment in the context of some nerve damage is the most effective way to go forward. We also focus our attention on treating any of the potentially reversible causes that may be contributing to your neuropathy. For example, if you have a vitamin deficiency, vitamin B12 is linked to increased neuropathy, or if you're diabetic, effectively managing these can also help reduce the neuropathy. Our focus then is on managing the symptoms, principally any discomfort that may be caused by nerve pain and nerve damage. We use very particular drugs to help manage nerve pain. These particular painkillers target nerve pain and are most useful for people with painful neuropathy. Sometimes your haematologist may actually refer you to a nerve specialist called a neurologist to help manage this, and that is perfectly normal. If you have some numbness in your feet, it can affect how you walk about, and we need to make sure that you're aware that those slips and trips that can occur can result in an injury. One of our key goals is to make sure when we're managing you with a diagnosis of myeloma and through your treatment that we're maintaining and maximizing your physical functioning and how you go about your day, your work and living your life. Alongside the focus on reducing the drugs that may cause neuropathy and giving medications to help manage any discomfort, there are some non-drug related things we can do. Many patients find that using regular creams to help keep the skin moist and not dry can help significantly. Emollients such as skin cream, such as cocoa butter, have been found to be very useful. Another cream that may be useful is called capsicum cream. Capsicum cream is a chilli cream and if you have some painful tingling and pins and needles in your hands and feet, some people have found that applying a little bit of this cream to that area can minimise those symptoms. We know that the use of menthol cream acts on the receptors for cold and can also improve sensory neuropathy and those altered sensations. A few people may find that if they have very painful skin and tingling and pins and needles, that topical lignocaine can help. This is a topical cream that helps numb the skin and is sometimes useful in people with severe neuropathy. Some other strategies that may help to minimize peripheral neuropathy that my patients find particularly useful include the use of massage, massage to the hands or feet, the use of reflexology, and even the use of acupuncture. Although we don't have good evidence for the use of these strategies in science and medicine, people anecdotally do find they may help. The thought is that it may improve circulation and certainly reduce those symptoms of tingling and pins and needles. We know that exercise and increasing your physical activity can also help reduce the effects of peripheral neuropathy. It can help with general strength, balance and gait. And increasingly, the importance of exercise we know can help with a range of other symptoms such as appetite, sleeping, fatigue and many more. Wearing of low resistant bed clothing can also help. When you go to bed at night, if you do have tingling in your hands and feet, then using bed sheets that are low resistant, such as silk, 
means that those bed sheets don't irritate your skin at night and wake you up. Similarly, wearing socks that are firm fitting, such as flight socks, can improve circulation and help reduce the tingling and the numbness that you may feel with your neuropathy. Increasingly, we are becoming aware of a range of supplements that may be useful to manage some of these symptoms too. Principally, the use of vitamin B complex, but also the potential use of fish oils, glutamine, and some other supplements. The use of supplements to help manage peripheral neuropathy is not well evidenced, and it is important that you discuss with your doctor before you do try any of these supplements. But the ones listed in the slides are ones prepared by the International Myeloma Working Group and have been used in patients with myeloma and peripheral neuropathy. We'll now talk about the second common symptom related to myeloma, and that is about the side effects related to steroids. The devil's in the decks, as I say, and many of my patients will know what I mean by this, and many of you will too. It's probably helpful to just describe to you what we mean by steroids. The steroids I'm talking about are corticosteroids. These are naturally occurring hormones that we all produce in our bodies. They have a role in maintaining many different actions in our body, including our response to stress, they manage alterations in carbohydrate, protein, and lipid metabolism, and the balance of fluid and electrolytes in our bodies. Steroids have a very important role in preserving the normal function of most body symptoms. So why do we use them in myeloma? Steroids have an anti-myeloma effect. They actively kill myeloma cells. But more importantly, they work very well in combination with other myeloma drugs to work very effectively against your disease. Steroids also work very effectively to manage a range of other side effects, such as pain. Steroids are a very powerful anti-inflammatory and can reduce swelling and reduce pain. They are also used very commonly to help manage allergic reactions you may have. If you had a bad rash or a reaction to a medicine, we may use a dose of steroid to calm that down. So steroids remain the foundation of most anti-myeloma therapy regimens, and patients with myeloma are going to be taking many courses of steroids over the course of their disease. So what are some of the more common side effects related to taking steroids? You may remember I said that naturally occurring hormone steroids can affect and manage many different systems in our body. It's not surprising then that side effects relating to steroids can affect also most systems in our body. The severity and type of side effect does vary between individuals and sometimes these effects can be unpredictable. We know principally though that the higher the dose of steroid you are taking and the longer you're taking it is a risk factor for the severity of the side effect. We know that the side effects usually occur pretty quickly within the first week of taking them, if they are going to occur at all. We know also in the medical literature, side effects are poorly described. We don't really understand what these side effects are and how they affect people with myeloma. But also don't forget, steroids are not often used on their own. They're used in combination with these other treatments such as chemotherapy and thalidomide. So sometimes the side effects all get muddled up a little bit. The range of side effects caused by a combination of drugs can make it difficult to, for us as doctors and nurses to interpret what drug causes what effect. A useful way of describing what side effects may be linked to steroids is to describe to you a syndrome called Cushing syndrome. Some people, not with myeloma, naturally produce too many corticosteroids and we call this Cushing syndrome. The side effects I've listed there in the slide for you include having a high blood pressure or hypertension, retaining of fluid, which we may call edema, which can occur around the abdomen or the ankles. You may find you get terrible heartburn or reflux when you're taking steroid. And you certainly might find that the steroids make you have a change in mood. Some people describe to me they feel quite edgy 
on the day they're taking their steroids, and they certainly may describe that they find it very difficult to sleep. Steroids can cause an increase in energy on the day you take your steroids, and something we call a letdown effect on the days you're not taking your steroids. In the long term, steroids can cause your skin to become more fragile, and you may find that your skin breaks more easily. In the long term also, people on steroids are at increased risk of infection, and if you are diabetic, it can cause instability in your blood sugar levels. People can also describe a general muscle weakness, particularly if they've been taking steroids for many months or many years. Some people also describe that their vision is blurred. And we may say to patients, don't have a change in prescription of your spectacles if you're taking steroids, because it should settle when you cease taking the steroids. In the long term, it can also contribute to the formation of cataracts. It's not all bad though. There are some positive effects from taking steroids, and many of my patients do describe those to me. They do feel that they're more energized and they may have a sense of euphoria when they're taking their steroids. And certainly if they've got some aches and pains caused by myeloma or just by arthritis or other conditions, these may be improved when you're taking steroids. One of the most troubling effects that steroids can cause, and they don't affect everybody, is the changes to your mood. Sometimes steroids can make you feel in a high mood, but also in a low mood. And sometimes it is the patient's husbands and wives that appreciate this more than the person actually taking the steroid. It is this edginess and change in mood that if you don't understand or know can be attributed to steroid, can catch you unawares. Mostly this can be managed though, managed by learning the change in mood that can occur, but also with dose adjustment and scheduling of the medication. So, how do we go about managing the side effects of steroids? We could divide that into two different sections, pharmacological or drug management, or supportive management. If you are experiencing a side effect, we may need to adjust the dose of the drug that's causing it. We very readily reduce the dose of steroids, or we give the steroids in a very different way. For example, if you were having a high dose on one day in a week, we may actually give you that same dose, but over several days. Some other supportive medication that we use very readily help manage the symptoms of those side effects too. For example, if you get reflux or acid burning, we may give you an antacid. Sometimes if you're really struggling to sleep at night because of the increased energy by steroids, you may need to take a sleeping tablet on those days. I mentioned that you can get a little bit of fluid or edema when you're on steroids, and sometimes some patients may need to take a water tablet or a diuretic for that. Very occasionally, if you are affected by altered mood, we can use mood stabilizers to help with that symptom too. Some of the non-drug related strategies that we use include the use of meditation, exercise again can be very, very useful. If you're finding yourself edgy and having increased energy on steroids, then you can go and walk that off, run around the block, do some sport and that can help. Relaxation techniques are also very useful. One of the most important things I do as a nurse in myeloma is to talk to patients to make sure they are fully informed and aware of the full range of side effects that may occur but not necessarily happen to them. Some of my patients find it very useful to keep a symptom journal, particularly in the first few weeks or cycles of treatment, and it certainly helps when they have their visit with their doctor to help describe what symptoms they may have had. Other patients find it very useful to talk to other people similarly affected. Why not consider joining a support group so that you can talk to other people with myeloma, their families and friends, share experiences and tips in how they manage their symptoms. So finally, the main symptom that I'm gonna talk about is lowered blood counts. 
if you have too many plasma cells in your bone marrow, which is the case when you have active myeloma, that all those other important blood cells don't have room to grow normally and are therefore reduced in number. The most important blood cells in the bone marrow can be divided into three different types. Red cells, white cells and platelets. Red cells have a role in carrying oxygen and help give us energy. If they are lowered, we may be anemic. Symptoms of that are commonly shortness of breath, fatigue and sometimes palpitations. White cells help protect us against infection and there are many different types of white cells. If we have a lowered number of healthy white cells, we are at increased risk of infection. Symptoms of that can be having a temperature, having shivers or rigors, maybe having a sore throat or a cough, or if you have a line in to deliver treatment, such as a central line or a PIC line, you may have redness or inflammation around the site of that line. And finally, platelets. Platelets are important cells that help our blood clot at the site of an injury. If our platelet count is low, we would bruise more easily and we may bleed more easily, such as having a small nosebleed. We also know that the treatment or the therapy to manage myeloma does unfortunately actively kill healthy blood cells. But regular monitoring of blood is the hallmark of managing myeloma and other blood cancers. If you're in the first few cycles of treatment, lowered blood counts are more common. You may find that your doctors and nurses want to monitor your blood more closely in the first few cycles of treatment. Another important way of managing reduced blood counts is to reduce the dose of the drugs that are contributing to these. Again, we have clear guidelines to help make those do dose adjustments. We also focus our education to make sure that you're aware of the common signs and symptoms related to lowered blood counts, such as having a temperature, having a sore throat, noticing any extra bleeding or having a nosebleed, etc. And most importantly, as well as recognizing those signs, learning to act upon those signs and communicate them to your GP or your hematologist or nurse. Having a lowered white cell count makes you particularly at risk of having an infection. The risk of infections in those with myeloma can be particularly high and it's worth a special mention. So how do we go about managing the risk of infection in myeloma and minimizing that risk? Again, it's very important that you and your family and friends are aware of the particular risk factors. We've mentioned that you're at increased risk if you're having certain treatments. Understand if you're on those treatments and you're at a higher risk. Attend the regular blood test monitoring. It's an important aspect of your care. Another important thing to remember is to minimize your exposure to known infections. If you do have friends and family suffering with an infection, it may be good to avoid their company, particularly if you're at risk of infection, having just completed a transplant or you're taking chemotherapy. Be aware of the signs of infection and most importantly, act upon them. Sometimes people have a lowered level of healthy immunoglobulins and it can be useful for them to have regular infusions of a product called Intragam. This gives you some increased natural immunity and is particularly useful if you've experienced recurrent infections. We know that myeloma and its treatment can cause a range of common symptoms and we've talked about some of those in this film. It's important for you to be aware of the likely symptoms and side effects that you may experience in your individual case. Make note of any symptoms. You may like to consider keeping a journal and let your doctor or nurse know about them at the next appointment. Most importantly, you need to act upon any signs of infection. That's probably the key take home message today. Your GP is a very good first point of contact in the community if you're unsure of the need to report a symptom to your hematologist or nurse. It's important also, under the guidance of your GP, to maintain the routine health monitoring, such as managing diabetes or your blood pressure or any other conditions you may have. 
a critical component of managing myeloma is managing the effects of the disease and its treatment. It's important to be able to maintain good general health and fitness in order to maximise your quality of life and live well with myeloma.